So my name is Camilla Anderson. I joined the Sea Org when I was 17, and I was in the Sea Org till I was 47. And I'm originally from Denmark. I was born in Copenhagen and came to the United States to be in the Sea Org when I was 17. And because you were a second generation. Second yeah, my parents. My parents were Scientologists, and I went to Scientology school, and I grew up in that environment, and I was sort of primed for it. But I made the decision I was going to come to. Florida because I wanted to and that seemed like a good thing to do in life. You're 17, you're trying to decide what to do in life. Well, initially, I was really into it. It was a purpose. I was trying to make a better world. world. And as life went along and as my career went along and this and that and the other, I wanted to leave. I wanted to leave a lot of times. But the point was really I couldn't leave because I had no money. I had no family in the United States. I'd never lived in the United States. I wouldn't even know where to go. Um, I had no backup support, nothing. I couldn't drive a car. Um, I had a green card, and that was about the only thing. And I, I, what was I going to do? So that was honestly what the thing was. And I finally, in the end, decided I didn't really care, and I walked down the street. Literally walked down the street. After I arrived in the Sea Org, um, I was in the CMO, in the Commodore's Messenger Organization, and I was in that for 19 years, which is an upper, upper level, upper management, you can call it. Yeah. What does the Commodore Messenger all do? They police, they see to it that L. Ron Hubbard's personal projects, orders, um, advices, etc gets done and get complied with. That is a simple way of explaining what so they do. So most CO bases have a CMO unit. Every single CO base has. In back in the day when I started, they didn't. There was just like four of them. But as we went through time, more were started and so forth. And I, um, I was in the one at the um, gold base. I was in CMO SU, it was called the first, and then it was CMO gold. Is it fair to say you got less punishments and less atrocities because you were CMO? It's a double-sided coin, because on the one hand, yes, that's true. There was a lot of things I didn't go through. But on the other hand, if you messed up on something, the order of magnitude of what you messed up on was so magnified that it was way worse. So. It was a double-sided coin, double-sided sword. Like, I don't really know how to answer that, really, because it was both ways. Okay. So, you start off fairly new at in-base, and they start what we loosely call pig's burden, which is you're deprived of going back to your bedding and your own pillow. Tell me about that. I wasn't getting done what I was supposed to get done. So my penalty was to sleep on the golf course, which at that time was very common. A lot of people was being sent to sleep on the golf course. They would usually bring their sleeping bag, I guess, and sleep on the golf course. I was 18 at this point, and I, the concept of me sleeping out in the wilderness scared the living daylights out of me, so I didn't do that. So I went to the garage instead and found a chair way back in the corner somewhere, and I sort of crawled up and tried to go to sleep, and I, but I could hear the little, you know, the little mice, rat thing, ugh gave me the chills. It was awful. Anyway, so I didn't really sleep at all. I just sort of sat there and tried to figure out what I was going to do. So it was punishment for non-compliance? Yes. I was supposed to get, um, I was executing an evaluation at the time. And the evaluation was to get sales lines in from the gold base out into the other continents of selling, um, not selling, but basically the Oryx having the materials of Dynamics and Scientology to sell. So it was fun out about that I didn't go to the golf course to sleep. So then the next night I was sent to the golf course. And I found an old oak tree out on the east side. And I sort of sat in the tree instead of sleeping on the ground. I still could not deal with the thought of sleeping on the ground. So I sort of sat there and fell asleep a little bit or whatever. And as soon as it started getting morning-ish, I went back through um, the security, it was called the garage. The nickname was 105, but uh, it was basically where the security guards were sleeping. And I had to pass that in order to go back into the property. So I waited until it was like 
a time where I would be seen to coming back in so I wouldn't get in trouble again. I'd have to go back and do it again. It was a mix between, it's, a, it's an illusion because it's a mix between purpose, which is what drives people, but the penalties for not getting things done and not targets not met is so intense. And that first years from 84 to 87 was all the beginning of Golden Air Productions and a lot of construction and sound, audio, visual, sound kind of lines being put in and film lines being put in. And it was an intense time and period. Who cool sleep deprivation? Intense. The whole mark of well, those years was the sleep worst of the worst of the worst was. Well, actually, there's so many with the worst, but the one that I witnessed myself was the building of the studio where they, those guys that were building of the Elwin Hubbard Music Studio were staying up for 24 hours. They would go days without sleep, without sleep, without shower. Um, they lived all the way off the property out at what we called Happy Valley, which is the out in Indian Reservation. So they would have to take bus back and forth, and they would just stay and stay and stay. And um, ten years later, how many of them were still around? Twenty percent. Eighty percent fled. If even that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a revolving door of that kind of. Trouble. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, and it was also there was also a major hygiene issue because they would get so tired that they would disappear, and we would have to go look for people that were missing, but they were just falling asleep in the bushes over there or between these raw wood. This is, I couldn't stand this, but there were raw wood um, two by fours and two by four by sixes and all those kind of things to keep up the roof. But every, all the raw wood was covered in copper sulfate for termite, blah, blah, blah. So ev everything was like coated in this toxicness, but then you would fall asleep right in that, you know? I mean, they had no idea that that was what it was when they signed up, you know, and the whole thing that was pushed was, you know, this is before 1986 and L. Ron Hubbard was going to come back. So that was like the driving everything that everything had to be ready because he was returning to the gold base. So with that, you could pretty much be up for a week because you could do anything for him because look what he'd done for you. Is a sort of like oh, that was the unspoken mentality of just how it was because you at least deserve, he deserved that because he had nowhere to live and you had a place to live, so we had to make it ready for him to live. We, us, them, whatever, you know. I see. But that was, but that was, and it's not a correct mentality. I'm just saying that convoluted mentality. Yes. So... And the worst part about it, too, in addition to everything we just spoke about, is the fact that they weren't trained on construction. So now they're deep, they're sleep deprived. You go mentally numb after you don't sleep. And then what now? That's my view you're on it. walking robot. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of those guys were um, RPFers. They were that, uh, the rehabilitation project force that are supposed to be getting five hours of study a day. They went months and months and months and months never seeing any study. And when they finally went to study, they went to go crash for two days because they were so tired and exhausted and out of everything that that, you know, it, it was not, it was, there was a rough time. In 1998, I was personally the recipient of that. Um, I had received confessionals from a slideshow production that I had done, and I did not have my files in order. We couldn't find stuff. There was a lot of things that went on, and I definitely didn't have my cards all lined up for that production. So anyway, I ended up under a confessional. That was one thing. But the thing was that the group that I worked with, which was like 30, 35 people, which was my organization, CMO Gold, um, they were all gathered in the conference room of what became the hole, the SP hole, I think they called it later. So we were in the conference room there, and uh, Jennifer DeVocht, which was senior to us, was reading out my confessionals. 
the actual written down reports of exactly what I had said. And she was just reading them aloud. Everyone is sitting there listening to it. I was in the audience. Um, and it was brutal. There was many things to it. One, what was written was embellished. So I was very upset about that. Um, it took away any private life I had of anything, any emotions, feelings, thoughts, things I did. Everything was just done. You talked to an auditor thinking that this was one-on-one. -on -one yes. And that you were protected by the sanctity of the session. That's right. Well, I knew it was I'm not auditing you, which means that you're, what you're saying is going to become a knowledge report, which is pretty standard, except I've never experienced it being read out to everybody. Right. So that was really nasty. So and you give up your private confessional yeah. stuff, and now it's being read out to humiliate you? To humiliate me, to get me to take responsibility for it was the thought behind it. It really didn't. It really upset me even more. Um, and to make me have change, because I wasn't making change. Mm. Um, on top of that, what was horrible about it is that my husband, I was married at the time, we were in the same organization, he was sitting in the group. And that was, I never spoke to him really about it, because I was, we were separated. Like, I was living in one location, he was living in another. We weren't, you know, we weren't talking. And... Um, except after the whole thing was done and said. Now, mind you, you need to understand, this went on for days, by the way. This was this were like two hour long meetings over Camilla's, what she had done, everything read out to the entire group. Um, it was horrible, beyond the beyond the beyond. So anyway, uh, that happens. And then in the end of that whole thing, like two weeks later, I was sent to I was en route to, I hadn't been sent officially yet, to the Rehabilitation Project Force. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in a little interview space over in the production building on the other side of the street. And my husband, who I hadn't seen, came in. And he opens the door. And he goes, I cannot believe you. You are despicable. And he closed the door. And that is the last I ever spoke to my husband. Mm 